Hi, I'm Michael Zabo. I'm here at the Palo Alto Art Center. Um, I'm going to be speaking to the public today about my artwork, um, specifically Arch Cradle, the public piece that I did for the city of Palo Alto. So while it's, when, I went, when I first went to Rhode Island School of Design, I was sure that I was going to be a painter. That's all I had ever done, and that's what I love to do. Um, and then at one point when I was there, I, I, took a, I had to do some kind of sculpture work. And I believe this is the first sculpture that I ever made as an actual sculpture. And I just got so involved in it, and I felt that same just getting lost and hours going by and that curiosity. It was like the first time I ever got really into a drawing like that when I was in elementary school or junior high school. So it was kind of like discovering a new world for me. Um, so I, I still was interested in painting and doing a lot of other things as well, which is part of the reason I, I came back to another school here, but ended up going back once I really realized that I liked doing sculpture. I worked with different materials. This was a ceramic piece, did um, about seven feet tall. Um, I started playing around with sight, um, seeing how a sight can affect a piece of work and how a piece of work can affect and change a sight. Um, and I also discovered working with metal, which is now what I predominantly work in. Um, I think this was my first metal sculpture that was actually a full sculpture I would play around um, before that. But back at RISD, I came to a certain turning point. I, all the work that you've seen so far was kind of more the, the kind of selfish art making. Selfish just meaning like a pure, innocent expression of, of you know, thoughts and ideas or images that I had. I wasn't thinking about how it would be affecting other people or other places or anything around me. Um, but with this series that I did um, at RISD, I, I kind of discovered this, this thing that would become this reciprocal gift that kind of became a theme in some of my drive for the work I do now. Um, the, these were derived from ink blots where I would take um, actual ink blots made on paper and sew that shape onto fabric and kind of make an ink blot bag and then pour cement into that and then pull the fabric off. It's very kind of painstaking um, <laughs> to get the fabric off. But it would get these very interesting shapes. And from that, I, I realized that it wasn't just me making an object and putting it in front of the viewer and saying, you know, here's my art, look at it. It was, um, you know, the viewer saying, like, what is this? You know, why did you make a dragon? And I'd be like, oh, well, <laughs> why do you see a dragon? And it, was, it kind of worked like, you know, some of them I, I would put on. So it became more, the, the, the work was more of an experience than just an object. Um, it, was the, it was kind of this dialogue going back and forth, you know. I, I thought it was a lot more interesting to see how people reacted to it than to kind of just look at it myself. So I did some that was so before, I would kind of manipulate others as they were setting up. Um, so I was really fascinated with this, this idea that art could be more than, than just objects um, and that it, it has to do with the way people interact with it and I kind of took it a step further and this was my thesis project, it's called The Drawing Machine. And in this I actually encouraged people to come up and interact with this and push it and move it and make it swing around um, and it moves around and in turn the, you know, it's a collaboration between the viewers or the experience or as I might call them, um, that makes another work of art, a drawing on, on, the, on the paper on the ground. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of this, this journey for me, or the beginning um, of that part of it. Um, after I graduated from RISD, I came right back to California, because um, it's pretty hard to stay away from the Bay Area when you're born and raised here <laughs> for too long, especially after some winters in New England. Um, I got connected with a kind of um, a kind of a, a collective community on a property up on Kings Mountain in Woodside. Um, I was asked to run a metal shop up there um, for the community and do some kind of structural metal work and other other projects for that area, Woodside and Portola Valley. Um, and part of the job was also living up there, and I got offered to build my own living space. Um, and this was a huge opportunity for me, and also really opened my eyes to, um, you know, m something more than art could be. So what I built was a geodesic dome. Um, the frame was already there, kind of like those, those playground frames that you see, and I had been doing this cement fiberglass 
um, technique where you can get cement very, very thin and very light, and I made the panels from that. Um, learned a lot about electrical wiring, plumbing, and construction that I never really learned in art school. Um, so, <laughs> and uh, you know, after doing a geodesic dome, doing a normal room is really easy because everything's 90 degrees. It's amazing. <laughs> so. Um, after I built this, I lived in it for three years. Um, and this was my home while I was living up there in the beautiful redwoods um, and, and running this metal shop. Um, and this really connected me, this really made me understand um, this idea of art being, you know, this, I look at this as the biggest sculpture that I ever made in my life. I'm like, wow, some of y'all like to make a big 20 foot sculpture and then live in it? And that was great, and, but then in living in it, I also experienced kind of being on the other end of it. I, I was viewing or experiencing my own art in, in, a, in an intimate way that, that I never thought I would be. Um, and it really kind of, you know, pieces that I, that I will do commission for people now, I, I kind of, have, it, this experience really helped me understand and, and, and think about it that way when I'm designing something. Um, but at this point in my life, um, I was working in this metal shop, and I built this dome. And you know, because I had a metal shop at my disposal, I—that's what I was kind of playing around with a lot with my own art. And um, I kind of decided I wanted to go out on my own, and I wasn't really interested in just doing the kind of gallery scene. And I thought about maybe making something kind of sellable, functional, smaller, and just seeing how it does. And I ended up kind of deciding on trying to make some bases with the different textures that I use. So. Um, this is how, this is, this is the first step I actually started selling, um, and it, it was from up there, you know, where I was working in that metal shop in my spare time making them, and they started doing well, and even today I still, you know, have a, have a line and make kind of a limited number of these, and they're part of my, my bread and butter, because I'm not at the point completely depending on public commissions, or large commissions, and um, I don't, I don't, I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket right now. So um, these are just some of the different bases that I started making, continued to make, um, and uh, and then from there I, I I I thought about other functional stuff going up in scale, and I started making um, fountains. This is one of the earlier fountains that I made, um, freestanding or installed somewhere. Um, first started making freestanding ones, started selling those, different indoors or outdoors. Um, and then at a certain point, um, I got asked to do a commission. And my first commission, I went and was faced with this space. Um, this is at, at a private home in Portola Valley. They wanted some kind of water feature built into this fallen bay tree stump there. Um, it was my first experience with the process of looking and seeing a client, whether it's a you know, private home or, or a city. Um, you know, they have something they want, something they wanted to accomplish. And you know, I'm just supposed to throw out my ideas, so I brought them several different sketches, and you know, we, we narrowed it down. It was a really collaborative process, um, and I came up with a sketch. This was a sketch that they kind of chose, and I kept developing, and it turned into this finished piece. Um, and you know, this, at the end of this process, my first time doing it, playing a lot of stuff by ear, but you know, as I as I kind of was figuring it out. Um, I really love the process of the end. It's way, it was really like a collaboration between me and the client and also the space and, and what was going on. And I just, I really love that process and I knew that's the direction I would want to go. I mean, it was, I, I got this kind of sense of a gift out of it and just seeing the look on the people's faces who live there and they continue to enjoy it. Um, it was just much more gratifying to me than, than, than making an object um, and then, you know, just putting it out there, even though I still like it. Um, but, um, so from there, I, I did start doing some other commissions, sometimes, you know, changing, just altering designs. Someone like one fountain, and I would alter it for one place for them. Um, did even some just straight sculptural commissions. Um, this was actually the, the purpose of this, is they had a, an air vent on the wall that they wanted to cover up, but they also wanted a piece of sculpture. <laughs> so, and, you know, this form here may seem familiar. By the end of this talk, um, so so I'd say you know I was I was doing uh, you know several several private commissions, making bases, making my own art as well, 
um, just getting to the point where I was kind of starting to make a living, um, and uh, and uh, I heard from a friend that I hadn't done any public pieces. I heard from a friend that there's a call for artists for a public sculpture to be put in Mitchell Park. And um, growing up here, I grew up you know until I was I think seven. I lived basically across the street from Mitchell Park. My brother and I used to play there when we were kids. I decided to go for it. I went and visited the site, and this is the empty site that I saw. And I'm like, oh, it's the alligator pit. This used to be a, like an empty pit when I was a kid. My brother and I would play in there and pretend it's an alligator pit and jumping over hot lava and all that. So we, I was so connected to this park um, throughout my entire life. It was something that like nurtured me and raised me, just like the city of Palo Alto. So I really wanted to kind of come up with with a proposal that that really expressed that. And I kind of I came up with the concept of of the fact that you know a city like Palo Alto, and especially a park, it, it kind of cradles a community and nurtures it, but also provides an archway challenging it to go on. And um, I came up with the proposed sculpture, Arch Cradle, and this was the original sketch for it. Um, I was selected as a finalist with my proposal, and um, as Terry mentioned in the beginning, that they had a, a wonderful new process of having the community actually vote between the finalists and choose it, which even more strengthens you know, my whole idea of that the community is actually involved. It's, it's just as much a creation of their own as it is a creation of mine. Um, you know, so, um, and I, my piece was selected, so now I'm just gonna kinda go through the process of, of uh, making the arch cradle and putting it into, uh, these are the schematic drawings I had to do to get approved by the city engineer. Um, to help me kind of figure out, um, as Jennifer mentioned, it's like, okay, I got the idea, but now I actually have to make it, okay. <laughs> so, this is kind of a good way to help that happen with me. Um, you can see it's made, um, the, the total, it's, not 20, it's 20 feet long total and about eight feet, a little over eight feet tall, or a little under eight feet tall um, total. And it's made from basically five um, identical kind of crescent shapes, but at three different scales. Um, so what I did was I started out, this is the model that I referenced off of through the whole process, the whole thing is symmetrical, so I was constantly making measurements and doing calculations to make sure I was right, and not a straight line and the whole thing, except, you know, on the surface. Um, so there was a lot of going back to that model. Um, so I started out just making the different crescents, and these are points in space of the curves that I just... I had to mark out and do this um, two times in three different sizes. Um, and then the curves start laying down on it. And then I have the gussets making, um, connecting it and more. So uh, two down and a few more to go <laughs> at this point. Um, but once they're all done, then it all goes up in my studio. Um, and it's time to start kind of making the connections, cutting a lot of the points off. Um, we actually set up a time-lapse camera on top of a big shelf from this view, and so there's actually, on my website, there's a, there's a film kind of about the making of this piece and showing some of the installation. There's an interesting time-lapse um, part in there, but I'm just showing some stills from, from this at this point. So we're first, you know, placing the parts that touch the ground, and then the top ones go on with supports at this point, because just with the skeleton. Um, and then it starts getting skinned with stainless steel um, at all the points with the, with the structure underneath. There's kind of a close-up of the structure. Um, cutting out the, the parts with the plasma cutter. I use a template system, so I'll get the shape and then cut around that template to, to go on all, each of the different panels. Because the piece has strips of bronze on it, I can have these seams in all the right parts and they'll all be covered up and I don't need to weld them. Um, so there's not getting skin. Sometimes it comes in half. That's how we transported it, got it out of the door of my studio, and got it to the site. Um, sometimes you'd have to flip it over to get up parts underneath. And then the finishing begins once everything is welded up. And then the bronze strips start going on. You can see on that table in the back, I have all the different widths and lengths kind of laid out in some kind of system. Um, and then welding on the bronze strips that point, um, once it's patinaed and sealed, uh, it's time to pack it up and get it out of there. 
and then you have Arch Cradle finished in Mitchell Park. Um, so this whole process was really, it was really amazing for me, not only because it was kind of the ultimate in, in, in scale for me, um, but also it, it was even a more involved process than, you know, like I explained loving the loving that first commission I did and all the, the one since, because it was, it was basically an entire community, and then the community chose my work, knowing that was, was, was really great too, but it really, I really felt like this was a reciprocal gift that the, you know, this, the, the community of Palo Alto and Mitchell Park got something and I got so much out of it. Um, and it really, really felt good at that point. Um, finishing it. And just a few other views of it. And, you know, like I said before, my brother and I and, mom and my friends when I was a child, I used to play in this park. There's several, several other public sculptures in Mitchell Park that I remember playing on and around and had there were characters in my games and um, I really, I really, that was, you know, the gift that Palo Alto gave to me when I was a child and then when I come back to Mitchell Park and see something like this, it just really makes me realize like how full circle this process has come to me. So. I'd say most of what I'm doing now as far as the technical aspects of it, I learned nothing about in school. I mean, I wouldn't be doing or be able to do what I'm doing if I didn't learn what I did learn in school, which was more the conceptual and, you know, how I want to get to where I want to get to, but exactly, you know, how to hold the welder and how to do the insurance form, <laughs> you know, like, I didn't learn that kind of stuff in school, and, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning, and in, in fact, with, I didn't mention, but if, with uh, Arch Cradle, there was a, an issue with skateboarding. Um, at the beginning, it was, there were a few marks on it. I thought about graffiti, and that's why I put a, a, a sealer over it that would be easy to wash graffiti off of. And there hasn't been any problems with that. But um, um, with the skateboarding, they were going up in that middle part. Like right when I saw it, I was like, I think people are going to want to skateboard on this. And you know, I would if I was a 12 year old skateboarder. <laughs> um, so I couldn't really. I'm kind of young enough to be able to to know, to like identify still with that, but it's also you don't want that happening. We ended up having to actually take out some of the concrete in front of it so they didn't have it. And it, it's worked fine, I think. Um, I think in general also some studies have been done where it says that like the more public art a city has, there's just a little less graffiti unless it's really, really you know, controversial. But even then, it really generates a pride in, in, in place, you know. And and what you're saying counter I don't think what you're saying is counter to the effect. I think you know, it's a gift, even if, yeah, if most people don't like it. I mean, it's still, it's making them become involved in their community, whether they like it or whether they don't like it, it's, it's created that. You know, so. you know what's, what's a case to make for public art? Um, you know, I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of ways, I think that the most, you know, the underlying important one is that it really it brings communities together and it kind of changes it changes what a community is and how they experience where they live and even relationships and connections with other people around them, whether it be it's strangers or family members. Um, but governments can use a lot of other reasons. I mean, there's a lot of really amazing economic reasons, even just city, city image. Um, they can, you know, look at it an example like Millennium Park in Chicago. Um, you know, within a year, I think they, they, they could record like actual like surrounding business and real estate going way up, and that, I mean, that whole park in Chicago's public art program now is like basically a model for a lot of cities around the country. Um, but I think those are more kind of just selling points that, that are for the first thing.